No. Bienvenidos. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. As we wait for people to come in, my name is Mariela Rocha, and I'm welcoming you in the name of uh, LACNIC. I want uh, to welcome all of you attending this webinar that we are uh, conducting uh, in preparation to LACNIC uh, uh, 40, LACNOG 2023. This is the second of a uh, like meetings that we have organized from October the 2nd to the 6th in Fortaleza, Brazil. Today, we have a webinar that's called A Path Towards IPv6 Only Networks. And to that end, I'm going to leave you in the hands of uh, the panelists. We have wonderful panelists today. But let me remind you that the webinar is being uh, recorded and uh, through the chat uh, and uh, on the website, you'll find the link with the recording. We'd also like, we'd like you to know that we have simultaneous translation, Spanish, English, and Portuguese. You may choose uh, the language you prefer. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, just by clicking on the globe and then the language uh, you'd rather listen to. And now, Antonio Moreiras, welcome. The webinar is yours, so go ahead. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mariela. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Antonio Moreiras. I'm of NECBR, and uh, together with Eduardo and Anderson that are with us today, we are going to um, be holding this webinar together with the people of LACNIC in uh, the next edition of LACNIC, LACNIC 40. As Mariela uh, just said, it will uh, be held uh, in person in Brazil in Fortaleza, Sierra from October the 2nd to the 6th in Fortaleza. So for those of you who don't know it, uh, especially the Brazilians, I know that there are people from other countries that are with us today, but those of you who've never been to a LACNIC event and uh, you're here in Brazil, it's really worth going to Fortaleza. Fortaleza is a beautiful city and uh, the event uh, the, uh, uh, is very important. It is there that we define the IP um, um, uh, distribution uh, policies and it is there that we organize uh, many things and we did especially focus on the uh, practices and how to configure an ipv6 only network uh, with a, a data center how do i put a web server or other kinds of servers in um with an ipv zone IPv6 only server with somebody else that has IPv4 only so that they can each access those servers through IPv4. So how do I configure the network in a way such that internally everything in the IPv6, uh, everything in the network, you um, it's all IPv6, but you have IPv4 visibility. Today we're going to do it openly and um, my colleagues Eduardo is going to tell you how you do it uh, from out, from inside to outside if I have IPv6 only in my uh, network. And that can be also useful for users network. And so how can somebody that has IPv4 only, how can they have access to my IPv6 uh, um, uh, server? So today we'll give you an overview, just something uh, light but uh, we want it to be easily understood we want you to understand uh, what is the technology that we use uh, what we do and why we do it uh, in the tutorial that uh, will uh, be presented in lacnic 40 we're going to give you the details we're going to have give you to explain step by step how things are done in practice so you're welcome to come those of you who are uh, watching on YouTube, we've already been asked whether there's a certificate people are used to our lives. 
This is not a NECBR live, it's a LACNEC webinar, and it is uh, simultaneously taking place in Zoom, uh, simul uh, translated into English and uh, Spanish. Now we are speaking Portuguese, and uh, it is also uh, broadcasted it's, uh, through NECBR. So we don't give any certificates, but we're going to leave it recorded in the NECBR channel, and you may ask questions both in the uh, Q and A feature in Zoom or through the uh, YouTube chat. If you want to ask questions in the YouTube uh, uh, chat, you can do it. There are NECBR people that are going to forward us the questions here in Zoom. So now I'll give the floor to Eduardo. Thank you, Moreiras. I think that it's very interesting to to say that this is not the only tutorial that we are going to present in LACNIC 40 in Fortaleza. We are also going to uh, uh, talk about RPKI and tutorials on multiple connections, internet exchange, a range of topics. So it's worth for Brazilians to be with us. They, they already accompany us in our channel, but it's an opportunity that you have to, to go there to talk with us but not only with the NECBR professionals. There are many people of LACNIC that are going to take information to all the community. All the community will participate. So we're going to do a lot of networking. It's very good to say it so that the people may go there to really participate of the event. It's going to be in Fortaleza in Brazil. It's worth it. So let me now share my screen and I'll start talking about today's webinar. You may be seeing, or you must be seeing my screen, the path toward IPv6 only networks. So let's talk a little bit about history and motivation. IPv4 was created in 1983, and ever since we've used it, oh, we've used that protocol quite a lot, but uh, it has a 4 million connection, so it's limited. So we started creating, they created techniques to expand uh, the life of uh, IPv4, CIDR, DHCP, NAT, uh, those uh, helped expand uh, the lifetime of IPv4, but that was not enough. So in um, 1998, uh, they produced uh, the IPv6 protocol. So uh, the, the, then uh, we started using it with the idea of working uh, at the same time with the two protocols. While IPv4 was being depleted, we really started working with IPv6. But what did we see? That IPv4 indeed was depleted while the implementation of IPv6 was almost zero people were sort of fearful of using IPv6, so they ended up uh, leaving the implementation for IPv6 for later on. In 2011, we started with a framework because there was a global depletion of IPv4, So there, and the only thing that people had left was the regional stocks. People continued to use IPv4 until it was completely exhausted regionally, and IPv6 then started to become more popular. So we got to uh, close to 45% uh, in 2023. We are still uh, not using it so much, but uh, when uh, we uh, complete at least 55%, we'll be um, beating IPv4. We see that the growth of IPv6 is not uh, growing too fast, rather sluggishly. When, as we look at Google charts, for instance, we see that we almost have, uh, it's, it's almost a, 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 a plateau and IPv4 continues to be used. Um, so people are using um, uh, the, the different techniques available to extend its life. So where are we going uh, to continue to use a dual stack or IPv6 only? Or So uh, this is the time for uh, decisions. Uh, 
we what is our current situation we are thinking of using ipv4 and ipv6 uh, together because all the internet is an in ipv4 we can't uh, turn it off right now but we have to start operating with ipv6 so that someday we'll have ipv6 only and we'll be able to uh um turn to phase out ipv4 but now we are working dual stack with the two protocols at the same time so when the machine receives the two protocols ipv4 and ipv6 it will operate with both of them now if the uh, content that you want to access is in ipv4 only then the input will be in ipv4 and if the content is only in ipv6 then the communication will be in ipv6 now when we have content with both uh, protocols let me explain how the machines operate because in the previous webinar it was in uh, uh, linux how to deploy how to implement it and we know how to put ipv4 in linux so we're going to see how the machine works with both we have uh, the happy eyeballs technique that means it, that it works with both protocols it has a slight advantage uh, it gives a slight advantage to ipv6 so when you want to access a content uh, in uh, the internet then you start with uh, the name resolution uh, for a quad a for ipv6 and a for ipv4 example.com example.com.br for instance so you ask uh, what is the ipv6 address of example.com and what is the ipv4 uh for um and so we are looking for quad a and a but we are always going to um have uh, a faster connection there's a slight preference for ipv6 so you give a certain preference for ipv6 now if ipv4 is faster in connections we will maintain ipv4 the deployment of the two does not affect the network so we have to work with dual stack even because the Internet is IP4 and the addresses are becoming depleted in IP4. So we can start seeing IPv6 networks. So we have to speak with the IPv6 networks. So today we're considering working with double dual stack. Now, we don't know whether this will be maintained in the future. So we have to think whether we have to focus on having the two protocols forever. Now, what is the impact of having the two protocols that are being executed at the same time we need to operate with the two the routers will have to be sending the information through to the vendors will have to operate with the two the same with the dns servers and the programmers when programming apps they will have to work with the two protocols so this brings about a long chain of work for the two so this is something that we have to review you have to pay for this someone has to pay for this so we have to develop more things you have to operate with more things so this is a service that someone will have to pay for so the router will have a routing table for ipv4 and a routing table for ipv6 so we have to pay for the two and the same happens with routing the packet processing the packet so it would be more efficient to work with just one protocol in other words working with that situation with having dual stack is for the current moment now if we want to consider this for the future we really will have to pay for the two so internet will then become more difficult the devices as well the computers and so on everyone will suffer from this the entire chain will suffer from this now, let us consider a different path. Let us focus on IPv4 only. And these are the discussions we hear about the IPv4 only networks. Some say that this is the modus operandi of the current standard. Everyone is already in IPv4, but there are no more IPv4 addresses. We have to consider how we'll be able to operate with the amount of addresses we have. It might be insufficient. So we can try and 
do IPv4 transfers. This involves cost. And then the amount of IPv4 will be insufficient. Then you have to start considering devices as G CG now. And this will be a very heavy machine. This is a NAT that does have its cost. And then we have to consider double NAT, dual, trip, treble NAT. All this involves cost. You will not have to purchase the equipment. Then you have to consider a data center or a provider to enable that communication. It's not only a esse NAT compartilhado, esse PV4 compartilhado. We also have log storage. All the logs of this NAT, of the shared NAT. So if there is an increase in cost, we have to figure out how we'll be able to sustain our operations. So we need to have more resources. Once again, these resources, well, this is something that we have to review and pass it on to the entire chain. In other words, the end user will have to pay for having this access because all along the way, you have to go to the all the ends of the chain. Then if we consider the supply and demand law, we no longer have IPv4. What we see is what is what still remains there. Therefore, there's a high demand when there is a low offer. Therefore, this triggers all the prices. So this, these are costs that will have to be reviewed, and this is not such a good scenario. And what we like to do is to consider this scenario, explain the reality in Brazil. When we analyze the internet providers we have in Brazil, we see that the smaller ones work with IPv4 only networks. And those who are considering IPvC networks for the future are the larger providers. So therefore, who are those that have money? Who are those that have the resources? These are the larger providers. They are investing in IPv6. They have the resources. And who invests in the IPv4? These are the smaller providers who cannot cover the costs of the larger ones. So they are focusing on the future using IPv4. So we have to see how they work around all these costs. So this also has to do with the price that we will give the, the, the clients, the customers. Now, when we think about the data centers and the hosts, when we have services there, we have to offer means of offering IPv4-based services or products that will end up being more expensive. So the way forward is IPv6 forever. IPv6 was created to replace IPv4. It enables end-to-end -end communication because we work with public addresses. So the idea is not to have anything in between. So there we have a whole array of applications that are easier to produce, but there is a problem. All this requires study and applying something new. Many people don't want to go into all that trouble. So we have these three paths. And let us now look at the advantages and disadvantages. For example, from the standpoint of a professor, when we explain, when we teach all this to many network operators, it is quite clear that IPv6 only networks uh, offer a calmer future. You don't need to include machines for the purpose of translation. You don't need to include any machines in between that affect end-to-end -end communication. So this is a more promising future. That is why we spoke to LACNIC, because we wanted to organize this tutorial on how to create an IPv6 only network. This is so that we can understand the three possible scenarios for the future. And why are we considering IPv6 only as a good scenario? So how can you have an IPv6 only network? First, we have to start working with dual stack. All IPv4 is an IPv4, so you have to migrate gradually towards IPv6. We have to deploy IPv4 
six. Well, let me add something. Let me add a few words here. <clears throat> this has to do with going over to IPv6 only. We still have to persuade the providers about this, the, the, uh, the managers of the different companies. I always like to recall something that you did not mention. This is namely that at IETF, where the RFCs are created, when the protocols are specified, and where the protocols where the protocols are improved, there always is, there already is a guideline that states that everything that is developed for the internet should work with IPv6. And this is mandatory. So supporting IPv4 in the new protocols is no longer mandatory. And almost everyone uses IPv4. Now, the use of IPv6 is now mandatory. And I'd like to mention, I'd like to mention something else. You referred to the prices of using IPv6 for. With all the providers we've spoken at events and in courses, and whenever we meet them, economizaram dinheiro fazendo isso. All those who deployed IPv6 tell us that this implied savings. If we compare this with the cost of a CGNAT, it's not only about the device, it's also the cost of troubleshooting. There are many difficulties for deploying IPv6 how to select a CPE, the one that is most adequate for this. But all those who have done so, we have providers that have 100% of users in IPv6, 45 to 50% of global providers already have IPv6. So if there are any problems, people already figured out the way to solve these issues. People say they ended up saving things. They had savings applying this measure. And the third point that I would like to mention and speaking about technologies is the following. When we speak about IPv6 only, you spoke about this being something of future. Now, one of the technologies that we are going to see in the slide that you have there is 464XLAT. You have an IPv6 only network and IPv4 in the final devices. Many providers already use this. In Brazil, it's not so common. But for mobile operators outside Brazil, this is quite common. So many people use 464XLAT and also in data centers. So I wanted to add that. So back to you, Eduardo, so that you can speak about the technologies. Yes, I quite agree with you, Moreiras. This is something that we're going to see later on. Now, we have some options of people who are working with IPv6 today, working in IPv6 only networks. Now, going over to a more general public, it is worthwhile highlighting that uh, as we see 45% of use, some people, on the other hand, have, haven't even started to apply IPv6. So first of all, we think that you have to start working in dual stack with native IPv6. Now, if we see that there is a short of IPv4, and if they still have larger blocks, as in the case of universities that requested larger blocks and they still don't need to share this, they work natively with IPv4. So we have to work with, work with the two protocols. For those who have still, who still haven't done anything, is to first implement IPv6. And if they have issues with IPv4, they have to use the shared option. So as soon as we do that, the network already is well established. So we can consider a second step, which is gradually turning off IPv4. 
So we have to consider transition techniques so that IP form remains operational, not in the entire network, but in the machine that does a translation or in the reverse proxy. So we put IPv4 addresses for working in just one part of the network, and then we reach the third stage, namely when everything is established in IPv6, and then you will dis disable IPv4 and you will disable the translation machine. So this will be a gradual process. So for those of you who are asking questions regarding the slides, these are in Portuguese. What I am saying now, what you have on the slides, I'm saying this in Portuguese, but we'll see how the slides can be then translated into Spanish. But everything that you have there is what I am speaking, and you can follow the interpretation in Spanish if you wish. And then we have all the transition techniques, NAT64, DNS64, 464XLAT, etc. Now let us look at the first step, which is the one, the most difficult one. This is a step that everyone fears. Well, we are going to work with native IPv6. And then everything that works in IPv4, if this is essential for you, it should also work with IPv6. So there's no point in just putting IPv6, but you have to set the network working in IPv6. We have to update software. If there is a software that only works with IPv4, it has to be updated or also changed, or you have to speak with the programmer. So then they can implement a version that works with IPv6. If you have very old machines that don't operate with IPv6, you may have to replace them so that they can support IPv6. And we are going to activate them and enabling them little by little in a part of the network. You conduct rehearsals, you do a lab to test it, and little by little, you'll expand it to the network. So that in, in the end, you'll have native um, um, a native network. And some of one of the things that we highlight when we give classes is to have a routing plan. Even if you have a NECBR plan of LACNIC, uh, focus on uh, developing a good plan so you won't have to work in the future. So look at uh, the last uh, webinar on Linux and we talked about the routing plan. And if you have any doubts, you can see our tutorial. You can attend our tutorial at the event and ask questions, but start with a good plan so you won't have to redo it in the future and then to implement ipv6 and if you're already with native ipv4 in the network that would be the best case scenario but if you are already seeing the shortage then uh, see the good techniques that you have then we'll show the second step techniques that could also be used because they save ipv4 but in this first uh, step what we see more commonly in Brazil is to work with CGNAT. And there we have the two layers, uh, the customer's uh, house NAT and uh, in the provider. And we recommend to use the uh, uh, 100.6400-10. Here's an example. Here you have your network and you already suffer the shortage of IPv4 addresses. Here we have a customer's house uh, that needs IPv4 at home. They are going to use private IPv4. And what will happen? There's a NAT in uh, the customer's home and are going to uh, they're going to uh, receive IPv4 from another. In uh, their home, it's private IPv4. If they have uh, enough uh, a public IPv4, they have trans can translate it for a public IPv4, and if not, they're going to translate it to a private IPv4. The important is uh, to have a different uh, private network. So if you have um, the 2001 DB82, you can use, for instance, translate from um, the 192.168 to 10. And there you go in the network to 
up to CGNAT, and there it will translate from the private address to the public address. And so you save the I public IPv4 addresses by putting it in CG and NAT, but remember to work with IPv6. So here you have native IPv6. And if what you're trying to access is IPv6 and there is IPv6, you go directly to IPv6. If it's in IPv4, you'll have to go through CG NAT at home and then the larger um, NAT that is CG NAT to obtain a public uh, IPv4 address and, to, and so that you can keep the IP4 connectivity. What did we say about that network 164.0010? That is a network that is reserved for it to work in the CGNAT, in the provider's network, not in the customers or in a corporate customer. So you use 164.0010. This is a reserved network to work with CGNAT and the translation of IPv4, private IPv4 to a private IPv4 is no problem because this is not used by a customer. So it's a recommendation of use in, uh, that is in the RFC. So the first step, working with IPv6 native with public addresses. And in the case, if there are enough uh, public IPv6, uh, you can put it in all the machines, but if you don't, Think of having a, a NAT in a, the client's uh, uh, house, and you can put CG NAT um, in uh, the network. So that would be the first uh, step to start with IPv6. Now, after this phase, we have to think of the second step, where we see that IPv6 will be native in our network because we already did it in the first step, and we are going to start to slowly disable IPv4. The good thing about disabling or enabling uh, IPv4 is that we can have, we'll have to work uh, one single network, IPv6, So in our network, we won't have to worry about IPv4, IPv6. We started to use uh, IPv6 only, only one network. Now, if the destination has IPv6, then uh, all, everything, happens in IPv6. Now, if you want to communicate with uh, IPv4, we have to work with the idea of IPv4 as a service, AAS. So there we are going to keep these IPv4 addresses. They are a few, they are scarce. We're going to put them in a few machines that are going to work with some proxy or some transition. So we are going to leave IPv4 more for our few machines that will be in charge of translation or that are going to use the proxy. So that is the idea of the second step. Now, talking of some techniques with which we can work, we have NAT64. We think of a, a stateful translation. If you don't know what stateful is, it's a translation that keeps uh, saves the state. So we are going to save the IPv6 packet in, in an IPv4, and then the translator will translate it to IPv4. The I, public IPv6 addresses are going to be put in a translator, and we'll work with a very well-known prefix 64FF9B slash 96, and it is much clearer to show a design, a diagram of how the network will work. Now, an interesting thing to point out about this issue of the translators is that you don't have a perfect translation. If there were one, we might just use the translator and go on with IPv4 and IPv6 and not to worry about the issue. But as there's no perfect translation there, we need to think of shifting from one protocol to another, from IPv4 to IPv6. But that's, a, that's why we put it as a second step. But as IPv6 internet, uh, moves forward, you, you're going to see that translating machines are going to be used less and less. So we're going to have less problems. The clients that use IPv6 only services won't even need translation, so they won't even suffer. So it's mostly for those machines that want to have connectivity with a legacy machine that works with IPv6 only. But we have to highlight that uh, as the translation is not perfect, there may be software that's not prepared for IPv6 and won't work well. And some, there may be 
and uh, there may be some things that don't work, but we have some ideas and solutions for that. And here we have a technique that um, is uh, auxiliary to uh, NAT64, that is DNS64, that works, operates as a recursive uh, DNS of the host. And uh, it has a special thing. If there is no uh, quad A response, uh, uh, it uh, it will convert uh, the uh, uh, address using the same rule and prefix of NAT64. So let's see if we understand it. When we explain this, sometimes it's confusing. So we have, uh, uh, here we have the client, we see uh, this, may be applied to a data center. When we want to do something that is in uh, only in IPv6, and here there may be a, a data center that uses the NAT64 plus DNS64 technique. So we're going to give you real life examples of data centers that operate like this. We have an IPv6 customer and we'll look for the IPv6 registry that is quad A because we it won't look for an IPv4 register because um, it doesn't have it. So it's going to look for an IPv6. So that client, it doesn't make sense to look for IPv4 uh, because they won't be able to communicate. So it's going to ask for assistance to this DNS64 machine and DNS64 will a search for the authoritative uh, uh, DNS uh, chain, looking for all the uh, example, do, quad a example.com. And there may be an example where the site they want to access has no IPv6, so they receive a negative response. So the DNS64 says, well, but this customer is trying to access something that, that does it exist or is it, is the, is the way they, typed it wrong. So they ask for the A registry and uh, there you have a positive response saying that there is an IPv4 address for that domain that is example.com. So it says, well, the question game on, came on IPv6 and I know that I have uh, only an IPv4 response. So here, this is important. It's going to build an IPv6 uh, address with that prefix here. It's the other way around. So it's going to put uh, the IPv4 address inside the IPv6. This is for teaching purposes and the machines accept it this way. But if you want to be more robust in the way you are going to present IPv6, then you can transform it. So you're going to have an IPv6 address with an IPv4 address within IPv6 and it's going to believe that it's a quad A response. So it's going to move forward. So commu it will communicate with that destination. It's going to send the packet, the uh, packet using this origin address. Look at the sketch here. It's this address here. It will reach here to this uh, translator machine and not 64. And here what will happen? There's going to be a translation from N for one and uh, this is a translation that we will have stored in the state. So the destination has an IPv4 address inside, so it's going to put it in the IPv4 package where it will translate the IPv6 package to the IPv4 package. But it will, so we get to see the origin, it puts, it saves it in a, a worksheet and it takes a, a public IPv4 for that. And there it will communicate with us destination server it will receive the answer it will look at this at the spreadsheet will see who requested it it will see that it was his machine and it builds the ipv6 package if the origin of uh, this uh, uh, it, it will put the destination in the address of the machine that had queried because it had saved it in the worksheet. That's the idea of NAT64 plus DNS64. Here I'm only explaining the concept. Why? Because when we learn how to configure these machines, we're going to learn it in the tutorial that we'll have in the LACNIC event. So NAT64 
DNS 64 explaining the concept. If you want to learn to configure, attend our tutorial. Now we're going to see another idea that is 464x lat. This is a dual translation. That is why it says 464 because it goes from 4 to 6 and from 6 to 4. So we're going to have two um, uh, interpretations. Um, one is CLAT and the other is PLAT. PLAT is NAT64. So it's the concept of the previous explanation using this technique. So why was it developed? Because uh, we are going to try to give an IPv4 address to our client, to the machine of origin, even if we don't have a public enough public uh, IPv4 addresses, we're going to give a private uh, uh, address because there may be an app in the customer side that needs IPv4 to work, and then we're going to use the dual, um, and we're going to see it later in the sketch. We're going to use CLAT and the uh, customer side that it may be the the device or the router, just to give you an idea. For instance, Android, the mobile phones already have the CLAT and iOS does not have it because it uh, makes all the apps uh, operate in IPv6 only networks. For instance, the iPhones available in uh, when uh, Apple receives apps, you can't have apps in IPv6, IPv4 only. They have to be apps that work on IPv6 only. So if there's no problem, if um, um, uh, you you don't have to think of legacies, but we might have uh, older uh, devices that need an IPv4 address to work. So that is where we need CLAT. Let's see if I can explain. So our network will remain IPv6 only, and the customer network will have a private IPv4, 192.168.12. But my public IPv4 are in my PLAT. So I'm taking out the IPv6s here from the center of my network, from the middle of my network, and I'm taking out IPv4 privately over here. So I'm not disabling IPv4. I'm not giving this extension because there might be some machine that still requires an IPv4 addresses. So we're going to give it a private IPv4. We don't want to give it a public IPv4. So this is what we had mentioned earlier on. In CLAT, you can do this in the router, but this also happens in the device, in the Android device. So, and this is easier to understand over here with this schematic representation. So our customer that needs an IPv4 and has to connect with an IPv4 machine in the internet and all the internet and all the network is in IPv6 in the middle. So the cost client sends IPv4 to the CLAT machine. The machine will do the translation of IPv4 to IPv6. So it enters the IPv4 address in the IPv6 and it will go in the network in IPv6. The private IPv4 address is taken. It is carried to the CPLAT, to the NAT64. And because the packet will be in, in the IPv6 packet, I'm going to take the destination IPv4 address, which is a public IPv4, but look at the origin. I cannot use the IPv4 for a public IPv4 address. IPv4. This is what I had mentioned regarding the NAT64. We managed to communicate with the IPv4 service. And the same happens in the opposite direction. From IPv4, it is translated to IPv6 and then back to IPv4. So this is what 464xLAT does. Sometimes you have to configure this on the customer end, but it could also be included in the machine like the Android case, which we mentioned.
Now, what are the interesting things we can mention? We're speaking about outgoing communications. Now, what happens with incoming communications? Because if there is an incoming communication that wishes to be IP4 and the entire network is IPv6, with these two techniques, this is not possible. That is why we work with another technique. The previous cases solved these outgoing communications, but not the incoming. And here we have SIT and SIGGC. SIT is stateless IP for ICMP translation. So this is what the acronym means. It is a translation of IP packets and ICMP so that we don't have to store these. This is done one by one from IPv4 to IPv6. Then we publish the records, the A and pod A, in the data center. These are published so that everyone can access these services, which are only IPv6. And in case this were required, in case you require an IPv4 address, this is a translation that is done. So we'll be able to use this ISIIT for the data center. And this is a better option than the traditional ISIT because it used optimized IPv4. SITDC uses the same technique, but for IPv4. It looks clearer when we look at this translation from one to another. We have the IPv6 only network, and in this machine we have here, which we named BR, we're going to have the public IPv4s. Now, what we will do is to use a one-to-one -one mapping. Only those machines that require IPv4 connectivity will have this. So this is machine 2001 db 12341 and this will be matched by this public IPv4 we have over here. So let us see, here we have an external machine, an incoming connection that wishes to communicate through this device over here. This is our website, my hosting service, and what we want is the client to access the service. So what we have to do is to publish this IPv4 address, like the one we have mapped over here. It will stay in this SITDC. And what will happen afterwards? This is the translation that takes place. So I enter the IPv4 address from the origin device in this prefix in order to generate the origin. And then you have the mapping. So this is the destination over here. So it will communicate with our service. Our service will respond. It will go back to this machine, which is in charge of the translation, and will translate the IPv6 to IPv4. So we have the IPv4 address that is charged over here, and that was mapped in this way. So what we we can consider working with ITDC with NAT64, but we can also consider reverse proxy. This is our network. This is IPv6 only. This is our IPv6 service. And here we have the proxy, namely that works like a reverse proxy. So if a customer wishes to access IPv4, they will receive this reverse proxy, which will receive the contents from the web server. It will place it over here and will send a response to the user. What proxy does is to look for the content for the part that has the IPv4 request. And this is contained over here because our network only has IPv6. What does? would you like to add something regarding the transition techniques? Well, what we can do is maybe give a wider context. Some of the techniques that you mentioned, Eduardo, are adequate techniques so that we can have any type of host or device on the customer side, only IPv6, but they're accessing something in the internet that also has IPv4 or only has IPv4. And that's what I meant to say. So we have a customer that is IPv6 only. It could be a host, it could be a mobile phone, it could be a computer, it could be a server, just any device. But we're going to access something externally. So let us imagine a user that uses the internet, but also a server at a data center. 
So they tried to access a software update or an API or a public internet service that only has IPv4. So you were telling, describing some techniques. You mentioned NAC64 and GMS64. And this somehow is uh, misleading because you do agree to Conversão que troca the GMS. It changes the address to IPv6, and then this conversion changes the headers of the packet and sends these to the internet. This is an excellent technique, and it works very well, but with an exception, it doesn't work when the application in sign does not support IPv6. In other words, the software was written in such a way that it doesn't understand IPv6 addresses. It doesn't work with IPv6 sockets. So in those cases, you cannot use NAT64 nor GNS64. You also mentioned another technique, which is 464SLAT, and this serves for the same situation, but now it solves this problem, namely when you have an application that does not know or does not understand IPv6. So you're going to take converted IPv6, which changes it to a private IPv4, which works only within that host, and precisely is the CLAT function. So what we do is to deceive the application. The application thinks it has an IPv4, but it's a converted IPv4 that is used in the mobile phone. And then this works like NAT64. So there's another conversion and sends IPv4 to the internet and everything works. Now there are some comments that mobile phones have this, but it is still difficult to find a CPE that supports CLAT. So there are some that offer support such as this. Now, you mentioned another technique that can be used in this case, and that is proxy. Not the reverse proxy that we have here, but the direct proxy, like a web proxy. You can configure this proxy on the customer end. I only have IPv6, but I can access something that has IPv4 in the internet and use direct proxy. Now, the opposite also happens when there is someone outside in the internet that has only IPv4 and wishes to access a service, and I only have IPv6. So here you mentioned two interesting techniques. SIIT or SITDC, which is a sort of NAT, but this is something that we do one-to-one. -one. This is static. This is because there is no other way, no other option. With NAT64, we can map all the internet in a very dynamic way because we're using IPv6 inside and IPv4 externally, and all the internet fits into that internal IPv6. We can represent the 32 internet bits and the 128 bits of the IPv6 address with no issues. But when we do it in the opposite way, I wish to represent an IPv6 universe in IPv4, you have to do this on a one-to-one -one basis. Otherwise, it won't work. So from outside, outwards, inwards, you need static mapping the IPv4, IPv6 internally, and then you do the NAT conversion, which in fact is SIAT. And the other technique that you mentioned is precisely the one we see on the slide, which is reverse proxy. And this is precisely when you receive queries from the internet, they go through a service that can be IPv6 only. It then reserves IPv4 requests, but it connects to a web server and it mentions that it is IPv6. It could be a web server. It could also be done with Apache, with Nginx, and other similar ones. So this was just to describe the techniques separately, the ones from the customer to the server, the customer that access an internet service, which are NAT64, 464XLAT, and direct proxy. And then we have the techniques that are those that someone from the internet uses to access an IPv6 only server and IPv4, which is reverse proxy and SIT. In LACNIC's tutorial, we'll be speaking more about the configuration of the two techniques that we have just described, reverse proxy and SIIT, in addition to the 
configuration of the servers with IPv6 only. In some cases, these do pose some challenges if we don't have IPv4 operational, for example. Until not so long ago, this was quite difficult, but now it is simpler. So I think that those were the comments that I wanted to add. So we can continue now, or shall we go over to the questions? Well, I'm, I'm almost finished. So let's finish with the slides and then we can go over to the questions and you can then see which you can answer. We spoke about the second step and now this is the third step. We have to reach the IPv6 only network. This is the path we have to follow and that is what the webinar is about. So once we start this in closing down IPv4 in the network and all the rest of the internet, continues the transition to IPv6, and we won't need IPv4 anymore, there will come a stage where we can disable the IPv4 machines. So we disable the translation device or the proxy server we're working with, and these are the container of the public IPv4 addresses. <clears throat> This will not have an impact on IPv6, which is disabled the machine, and that is it. Our network is totally IPv6, so this would be the third step. As we mentioned before, we are considering the first, second, and third steps. In some companies, we are already along this path, but many companies are still in this first step. These are some success stories that you can read afterwards. We have IPv4, IPv6onlyhosting.com. This works as a data center that is totally IPv6. They use NAT64 and DNS64 and a load balancer to work with reverse proxy. So they don't need to worry about anything because with NAT64 and DNS64, they have the outgoing communications and incoming communications are done with HA proxy, for example, as an example. We're going to explain how all this works during the tutorial we'll be having in the Fortaleza event. But this is to show that uh, there are some success stories and that these are already in the third step. Facebook also uses IPv6 only in its data centers in 2017, and they only work with proxies in order to cover those users who wish to access internet through IPv4. There you have a example of two different proxies with a layer four and with a layer seven. And there are also other cases. This case of Facebook is quite old somehow. We're now in 2023 and they have been working with networks with IPv6 only networks. And this is another case of a Swiss company, which is a data center with, that works with IPv6 only. The interesting thing about this is that you can pay for the service they offer, and the service, the IPv6 service only, is cheaper. It is cheaper compared to having an IPv6 and IPv4 service. So, working with both implies more costs. So if we don't want IPv4 and we were, want to work only with IPv6 and the transition techniques, we have uh, we, we won't have to work so much in the data center, so you can reduce costs. So this is another incentive. It's a financial in incentive. So I share this idea and then you can check it. But yes, indeed, you need IPv4 to, to be in your, if, if you need IPv4 also in your services, you can include it, but it's must, more costly. We're going to share this in the tutorial, but I wanted to mention it here. Now let's see the questions. Moreira, would you moderate um, the questions? I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen. Sure, Eduardo, let's start with questions. We haven't received too many. Well, I, I wanted to make a comment about what you just said about Facebook. I remember when these uh, big uh, content providers, maybe around 2008, 2009, when they started to implement IPv6, um, so, and they started with IPv6, they used a proxy to start uh, the 
um, uh, conversion. So all uh, the structure was IPv4. They used a reverted profit proxy with configured IPv6 uh, to give support uh, to the users so that they could use IPv6. I, I hope I don't uh, get uh, confused, but Facebook said, no, we won't do it this way. We'll do it the right way. Let's, we are going to implement IPv6 in our servers. So now you mentioned that it's not so new, but that has the IPv6 only structure and they're using the techniques to offer IPv4 to the users that requested. So it's very interesting. So let's start with questions. We have a question by Samir, Internet Libre, that says IPv6 will also be used for private networks or that's not necessary. And uh, so I'm going to try to answer. And if you want to add a comment. So even though I look very young, when I started at work, my IPv6 was in corporate. Uh, uh, but everything was migrating to IPv6. Uh, and, and many providers were migrating to IP. So, and uh, even the networks that had Apple computers used Apple Dock. There was IPX in the Windows and Apple Dock, and uh, then the internet itself. Uh, entered and everything started migrating to IP. So, but at the time we had three protocols at the same time, network, IPX, Apple Talk and IPv4. It was very difficult to manage all that. I remember of the networks times that they were celebrating going for lunch to a nicer place when they uh, succeeded in removing IPX, Apple Talk, and they managed to stay with IPv4 only. So I think that in a private network, within a private network, you can continue to use IPv4 for a time that has not been defined. Now, as things continue to migrate to IPv6, and we already have quite a lot of IPv6 in the networks, in the internet, as that increases, the machines are going to consider that it's complicated to manage all this and we'll try to press a bit more so that people will discontinue private IP before, but that take quite a long time. And it, it might be when we get to 100% of use of uh, IPv6 of the internet. Would you like to add anything here, Eduardo or Anderson? No, I think it's better to answer more questions because we don't have much time left. I just wanted to make a comment. I saw, for instance, that Percy Venturo asked a question about a lab for users to reproduce and uh, try to do this, and yes, we'll have one in LACNIC 40 Fortaleza. It's a sort of a workshop for the users to practice, so don't lose it. You'll be able to work with those configurations. Yes, Percy asked several interesting questions. In one of them, he asked what kind of uh, global companies have IPv6 already implemented fully and operating? Well, in corporate networks, in uh, the uh, co in the corporate world, I think there are very few. I know few examples. In NECBR, we have the internal network of IPv6 working, and also we have Stack, but it's working properly. Um, so we uh, uh, all the main players, uh, Google, Facebook, are different services with IPv6. I just wanted to add a comment, Moreira. There are some companies, uh, Cisco, for instance, that had an initiative of a complete building, and they only used IPv6 in that building. I think Microsoft did the same, and there are also some initiatives where they are using IPv6 
in one single building and then they start expanding it and they replicate it in other places. Eduardo showed the example of Facebook and this data center that have IPv6 only in the data center of Switzerland. But if I'm not wrong, Cisco already has quite a lot in that they have full buildings that are IPv6 only. And I think that Microsoft too, and maybe LinkedIn also have something of that kind and they have access to ipv6 so they are starting with all that but we have to that we need to have more companies and other good more organizations adopting ipv6 so it's uh, and so where are the workers at the offices uh, the um, um there's a question by anderson silva that says uh, the following. It came from the U YouTube chat. Uh, he asked about a link uh, provider that has an asymmetric uh, uh, traffic. That is the IPv4 traffic goes one uh, way and uh, IPv6 in the other. So the path of IPv6 is worse. How can you claim about it? How can you complain for this to be corrected? Well, that's quite rare. Uh, Anderson, the most common thing that we see is the IPv6 routing that um, uh, IPv6 is doing even a little better than IPv4. People are more careful because it's new. So now, if you experience a situation like this, there are two technical uh, uh, tools that can be used. One is a uh, contractual and the other is uh, competition so you can contract you can hire another provider you have to hire the competitors so maybe maria if we want to sell a fish in some episodes we have a podcast uh, we have a layer eight and uh, this uh, is an old uh, episode and uh, the what we talked about uh, hiring an ip transit our guest said that there were cases where the people um, treat uh, the routing uh, forms uh, differently than IPv4 or IPv6. In some cases, IPv6 uh, follows other paths, and that should not happen. So I think that it's uh, sort of in line with what you said. You have to hire the competitors, but, but, but the policy should be the same for IPv4 or IPv6 if something happens and IPv6 has to go through other route. It's not good. You have to investigate what's happening. Now, another uh, other comment here by Enrique that has more to do with the webinar. It says, if a a purely IPv6 only client wants to access a purely IPv4 server, what would be the solution? A reverse site? No. In order for the IPv6 uh, customer to access something IPv4 uh, could be a NAT64 uh, or a 4x, 464x LAT. And so a user, an IPv4, and the other way around, an IPv4 user that has, wants to access IPv6. Do we have time for more questions or do we have to close? Eduardo tells me we don't have more time. So, well, I don't know whether anybody of LACNIC wants to say something, whether you want to conclude. Yes, let me close. Thank you all for all your questions. We know that people are very interested and well, this is the second webinar for all of you interested in this and going on uh, discussing this. We invite you, as Moreira said, uh, please join us at the event. You can connect either online or in person. You just have to register to LACNIC 40, LACNOC 2023, and on October the 2nd at 2 p.m., Fortaleza time, you can join the tutorial either online or remotely. And thank you all for uh, your participation. We hope to see you there. Well, the recording is going to be available um, in the near future. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Anderson, Eduardo, and Antonio. Bye-bye.